Good evening. This is Mae Brussel. This is broadcast number 592, April the 11th, 1983. And we will begin last week and the week before. I forgot to update you on what was happening a year ago today. Now, every year annually, I remind you it's income tax season. You know how that goes. And almost every year I've read on the air my letter to the Director of Internal Revenue going back April 15th, 1972. So you know I've been in it a long time. If you want a copy of these, this letter, the entire letter, you can write to me. I didn't put on the sheet that goes out this week. If you don't have it, it's from broadcast number 539 a year ago last week. But And I'll update what we did a year ago tonight. In essence, what I said to the Director of Internal Revenue, that was 11 years ago, to support the existing government in any way is to give approval to legalize murder and assassinations of our former president, John F. Kennedy, Reverend Martin Luther King, and Senator Robert Kennedy. The National Archives contains proof of the conspiracy to kill the president. Sixty and eighty million dollar budget for the archives pays for a classifying system that conceals from these citizens what's really taking place. I said the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms through the Treasury and Internal Revenue hire convicts eligible for parole to commit crimes when they are released. I hear the chimes outside, so I'll say it's K-A-Z-U-F-M, because on the hour I might have forgotten that. Okay. In the letter 11 years ago, I said the government, through alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, which was the tre- which is the Treasury that collects our money, they kill labor leaders, they kill civil rights leaders, they plant evidence, they infiltrate organizations, prime targets are blacks and Chicanos. That was back 11 years ago. Now it's millionaires and people even from the intelligence system. Then I asked for a refund in May of 1982, uh, and I asked for it every year, a refund of taxes. This year I didn't pay any. I live a life of poverty now. I don't make money, and I just barely get along. You see, I don't sell the tapes. I don't sell broadcasts. I do articles, but it doesn't equal my expenses. So I didn't pay the government a cent this year, and I gave them a lot more than if I paid the money. I gave them more, okay? But I don't, uh, this is the first year I haven't had to give them anything, but I've requested refunds. And in the request going back those years, I talked about Vietnam as a major sickness. The country had a coup d'etat in 1962, the Treasury Department. Uh, I went in some more about funding the Treasury Department to pay them is to dig our own graves. And I went into our Nazi, racist, barbarian behavior. This was long before Klaus Barbie surfaced as working for the United States government, which was just this year. I was saying this um, 11 years ago to support this system with my taxes is identical to the fools in Nazi Germany who bought their own gas chambers. And I put in a request for a refund, and they sent me a letter, November 24, 1972. The claim for refund is disallowed. Your reasons given on your claim for refund are denied. Now, interestingly enough, when I wrote that in 1972, April 72, it was two months before the Watergate address, and G. Gordon Liddy and uh, Mr. Caulfield and the various Watergate teams and Robert Martian. Martian was down the basement seeing the Nazi archives, the Gestapo pictures. Liddy, with his German Nazi fixation complex, was going around wanting to kill various people and had plans and had been involved in various uh, uh, dirty tricks for the federal government, FBI, and Treasury Department that he worked with. And Mr. Caulfield was threatening to kill James McCord two months later, and the Dorothy Hunt plane went down, and they were working in the Treasury Department, Liddy and uh, McCord, and not McCord, uh, Caulfield, and uh, a whole bunch of others that later were identified by name, but I was accusing them as being Nazis and assassins, and then Watergate came, and that um, exposed the team raw right at that time. A year ago, just a year ago last week, I did an update. I was talking about the Japanese experiments, and Carl Wiedenbach, the German uh, who uses the name Charles Willoughby, who worked for General MacArthur in the Pacific, and now I've located Wiedenbach in Dallas, Texas, and uh, I'll do more on Wiedenbach. I brought up the experiments of Americans and his permission to do that in Manchuria at the end and during World War II, experimenting and freezing and shooting Americans. Uh, a year, that was just a year ago last week, and a year ago tonight, April the 4th, 1982, it was 1982, 
I was talking about Antarctica and the politics because of the Falkland uh, War with Great Britain, the politics of James Forrestal and various Americans down in Antarctica, Admiral Byrd, the Nazi stations, the use of Antarctica for an, a war which would be inevitable, that it would be the launching base for World War III. And just a year ago tonight, I said Secretary of State Alexander Haig is at his happiest and best. He was with Mrs. Thatcher in London, smiling. And then a day later, he was with Argentine president. Well, Haig was fired right after he uh, was flying back and forth between Argentine and London. Haig was fired. And I know that he's the vicar of Washington was numero uno traitor. Well, that's a hard one. There's Fritz Kramer and Henry Kissinger in the gang. But it was about Haig's deception and so-called peace in the Falklands and his role with uh, Henry Kissinger and Fritz Kramer. And as I say, just a week after that or so, Haig was fired. And I referred to that book, The UFO, The Nazi Secret Weapon. Some of you have it. Many of you do. Some of you don't. Very important to read about the Nazi bases down in Antarctica and what the fighting was about. That was just a year ago uh, this week and a year ago last week. Now, interesting this week, a friend, World Launcher listener, I don't think she wants me to use her name on the air. She calls KGO and uses Josephine, so you'd know who it is. Has shortwave radio, listens every single night, tape records it. And this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, going over shortwave, I heard the broadcast, um, April the 9th, 1983, on the weekend, quotations from a magazine called TRUD, T-R-U-D, Radio Moscow. And this is what they were saying, and this goes all over the world. The role of the CIA is gradually becoming clear in the shooting of the Pope. The CIA was directly involved. At least one member of the agency monitored the final stages of Ajah's movements. That was Frank Turpel. Now, <laughs> about a year before... I referred to a broadcast, and many of you saw it, January the 11th, 1982, and you can get the transcript of this broadcast. It was called Confessions of a Dangerous Man. The transcript is $2, public broadcasting, 125 Western Avenue, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. If I'm going too fast, you can write to me or call me for that information. But I sent for a transcript of Frank Turple, uh, talking about his activities, and one of the things he said, the narrator said that Turple was absent from the court. He had fled the country and wasn't showing up for his hearings. But Turple made a tape in which he described his links with an astonishing assortment of individuals and organizations, including the CIA, the Scotland Yard, the Turkish Grey Wolves who trained Mehmet Aja, the man who shot the Pope, Colonel Gaddafi, the Libyan head of state, and Mr. Ramirez Sanchez, known as Carlos the Jackal, S-A-N-C-H-E-Z. He is close to Idi Amin of Uganda and Emperor Bokassa, B-O-K-A-S-S-A, -S -S another fellow uh, active in terror and greed in Africa. So a year ago, a little over a year ago in two months, Frank Triple was talking about Aja, and just this weekend... The Soviet Union, I guess, has said we've had enough already of the Bulgarian connection. Uh, we have evidence that Frank Turpel was monitoring in charge of Aja up to the moment that he shot the Pope. Now, that was uh, shortwave radio from Europe on Saturday. Friday, April the 7th, the Wall Street Journal had an editorial, large one called The Spy Wars, and it goes into the fact that now we know for sure that while we thought the CIA was under everybody's bed and doing all kinds of terrible things, it was the KGB. And the Wall Street Journal said the Pope plot was hatched in the nightmarish milieu of gun running, drug smuggling, penetrating Western institutions by enemy agents, unwitting collaborators. Claire Sterling tried to say in her network, terror network about this operation and now it turns out that the KGB has penetrated terrorism that has plagued Italy and so forth. It's a long article on the KGB, the Russians, the shooting of the Pope, and all this time, in spite of the Wall Street Journal and their editorials and editorials from all over the world and Marvin Kalb and NBC, in spite of all of them, the fact remains that Wilson, Turple, and Corkula and Murder Incorporated and the Central Intelligence Agency 
wanted the Pope shot. They probably wanted, as Lissio Jelly said, and he was about to be arrested and the Masonic scandal was going to break open in Italy. What they wanted was to have a network that would make Ajabi link to the KGB, and they said this is an act of war and let Ajah out of prison if he would smear these various people. Well, that doesn't work, and time will reverse all of the propaganda that these people have been dishing out for years and years. And speaking of dishing out, I got a call last night from somebody in the East. I, I will feel free to give you the name on the air probably by next week, but I promised I wouldn't. Now, somebody has been in Lebanon with Frank Turple, and Turple is squealing about the murder of John Kennedy. And those of you that have had the patience to listen to me for 11 years, this is the 12th year, or 6, or 1, or whatever. Yeah, It's a really nice in your lifetime to know that you did a job and did it well. It took a while. It took 20 years of research. But I laid the network for you. And the American Connections, one of them, if you go back to the back tapes I had on Theodore Shackley, he came over from Germany, went to Miami, and um, hired the anti-Castro Cubans, and he brought in the young Americans for freedom that were with General Walker and this Colonel Willoughby and Robert Morris in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and the H.L. Hunt and the Merchantsons, and there were oil people, there were the monarchy, the deposed monarchy, the czars, there was the organized crime syndicate, there was the military intelligence and the FBI of Division 5, William Sullivan and J. Edgar Hoover. But Theodore Shackley was a major operator. Edwin Wilson was a paymaster for the Bay of Pigs, as was E. Howard Hunt. Hunt's connection is with the Buckley brothers, with William and James Buckley, notorious murderous Odessa team, and uh, Corkula supply silencers and guns, and I believe... You'll find it within a very short time that the silencers at Dealey Plaza came from Mitchell Werbel's operation. And this whole team have been uh, the notorious killers for the American CIA, setting up headquarters, the Nugan Hand Bank later during the Vietnam War, combining our own narcotics, our killing and working just as the Vatican and the Italian government and the various people, many from France and other governments who went to South America, like Claus Barbie, the, the game is gun running, narcotics, and fascism, death squads, and so forth. We had our coup in Dallas 1963, so it isn't even the 20th anniversary of the murder of John Kennedy, and everything, every little thread that I've tied together or connected Will should all be in place on the anniversary, and I don't think I'll wait till November 22nd, 1963, to talk about this, but maybe each week, uh, next week, 15 minutes on new evidence or information on who killed John Kennedy so you can put it together every week and see how this country was overthrown. We can, once we recognize we have this dictatorship, get rid of it. The first thing is to understand who it is and what it is and how do you know it when you look it in the eye. Now, the rest of the broadcast this evening for the next 45 minutes, I'm going to talk about Helene Von Damme because this is the month where the confirmation hearings take place in Washington, D.C. And I called Washington, D.C. and got the telephone number of the person to contact there. If you have a pencil, um, write it down. Oh, I didn't bring the office number. You'll have to call the house and get that. I have the office address that you can write to Washington, D.C. for the hearings and appointment. You'll, it is Mr. Burke, B-E-R-K, 202, Erico 202, 224-3121. I called there today. He didn't return the call, probably because I left the message. But he's in charge of the investigation or taking messages on the confirmation hearing of Helene Von Damme for the nomination to be the ambassador to Vienna. Now, the hearings are the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Hart Office Building, Washington, D.C., 20515. Now, the members of that committee, you won't have time to write those down. Send me a self-addressed stamped envelope like you did for that one Odessa chart or other information that you want on these broadcasts. Send a self-addressed stamped envelope or go to your library and get a list of members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The chairman is Charles Percy of Illinois, and Helene Von Damme worked in Chicago campaigning for him 
he's the extension, the Illinois extension of the Rockefeller uh, syndrome and Nelson Rockefeller and Chase Manhattan brought in uh, the Nazi war criminals described so well in the Belarus, uh, the story of John Loftus, of the Nazis, Mr. Wiesner of the CIA, Frank Wiesner and Richard Nixon and Nelson Rockefeller. And Charles Percy is an extension of them. And that was one of the offices that she campaigned for him in Illinois. So I've put in a letter to the various members of the Senate Foreign Relations that he really should not vote on her appointment to Vienna, even if he doesn't remember her, because they get a sudden loss of memory when they uh, have a conflict of interest. Another man on the committee is Senator Jesse Helms. He's the one person practically in the Congress who has held against signing the Genocide Treaty. He has a love affair with the Nazis, so when you write to him, you it's worth the 20 cents, but you won't make much headway. And then there's others, Senator Lou Gar Mathias, Nancy Kassenbaum, Larry Pressler, Rudy Boschwitz, um, Senator Christopher Dodd, there, Claiborne Pell, uh, Mr. Paul Songus, Alan Cranston, Paul Sarbones. There's a list of them from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Just send me a self-addressed stamped envelope. I'll give you their name, address, and we can write and get on that. Now, I want to go into the background of Helene Von Damme. Why am I afraid of having her ambassador to Vienna? Why is this a thing that I think should be investigated. She hardly is qualified for anything that she's done up till now, and yet uh, she's going to move on to another promotion. Now, when I say people in the Odessa, how do you know them? What is the Odessa? What is the terrible Odessa? I refer to uh, of Otto Skorzeny and Martin Borman's network. Well, David Emery reminded me, and it's in the book of, on the life of Otto Skorzeny by Infield, the conclusion of the book the world of Skorzeny, this is the way Mr. Infield closes the book. He tells how Skorzeny's ashes were flown over native Vienna. Maybe she wants the karma of Skorzeny going back there. He died July 7th, 1975. And this is what Mr. Infield says. He says, Skorzeny and his commandos during the Third Reich uh, worked, they set up the Odessa, O-D-E-S-S-A, those members, and they were for the post-war years after the war, the leaders in modern-day terrorist tactics all over the world, his methods were used. The IRA, the PLO, the SLA, the Biedermannhof, and these all go to, to the CIA that, that hired Skorzeny, and all these operations were funded and formed by the CIA, the Black Liberation Army, and so forth. He said the violence and brutality of Skorzeny's actions during the Hitler era have been well documented and are known throughout the world. And this is true, just as Klaus Barbie's were. In the long run, however, it is his clandestine activities with the Odessa after the Third Reich that has the greatest effect, and it will continue into your future. His determination not to allow members of the SS to forget their oath of allegiance to Hitler and to the Fuhrer's principles is the legacy that Skorzeny left. To organize them into smooth, functioning, efficient group was a master stroke. The Odessa is undoubtedly one of the most dangerous threats to man's freedom today. Remember, I talked about Mr. Blue Dorn of Gulf and Western or Mr. Peter Drucker or Henry Kissinger or Fritz Kramer as being Odessa, tapped into the Odessa. It, he says the organization keeps a low profile. It's successful. It's surreptitious. Members gain their objectives by being unnoticed by the public. That's why we have to put the light of day to these people, unnoticed by the public. And he goes into the fact that Odessa tried to kill B. Clarsfield. That's the Nazi hunter that brought back Claus Barbie, July 5th, 1979, when the car was blown up. The Odessa kills people, tried to blow the Clarsfields apart in 1979. In the political realm, Skorzeny contributed to neo-Nazism. His Odessa members contribute funds to politics. They get influential positions. Terrorism, the Skorzeny syndrome, is flourishing in the modern world, which is a reminder that Hitler and Nazism are taking their toll more than three decades after the Third Reich. He says collapse. It never did collapse. It continued, changed office numbers. That's where I don't agree with Mr. Infield. But he's talking about the importance of the Skorzeny. Now, taking Helene von Damme's career, 
I did what I love to do in the way of charting now. I take these large accounting books and I put the years of her activities and I did an overlay of Helene Von Damme's years of where she was and what cities and her position. And then I did Otto von Bolschwing because she ends up in Sacramento with Otto von Bolschwing and he took over the Reinhardt Galen position in when Galen went on to uh, have his own operation in West Germany. Reinhardt Galen from 1945, from May of 1945, just when the war was winding down, until 1956, worked with the United States. And then Galen opened up in West Germany his own operation, hiding from the Russians all this time, but setting up our National Security Council and CIA. And another person important to the career of Helene von Damme is William Clark, who now has the large job of head of our National Security Agency. He's the chief of the National Security Agency, and his life and Helene's and von Bolschwing overlay, and I believe they are Odessa and Galen agents. Now, Otto von Bolschwing set up TCI that I've done broadcasts about, and we'll do some more on that and her relationship to that organization. Uh, he set that up, and he meets up with her in Sacramento after Mr. William Clark has put her on the staff as the secretary to Ronald Reagan. In 1933, von Bolschwing was in the Nazi party. Then he was in Palestine and Romania transferring wealth of Jews whose money was taken. They were uh, being uh, ready to be wiped out, transferring the capital out of Europe. He, von Bolschwing was with William Donovan of the OSS in 1939. He was a member of the SS. He joined the SS in 1940 and was with Donovan in 1939. And 1943 and 44, he started working in the OSS, United States and the SS, Hitler's SS simultaneously. And he worked with the United States Army until he came to the United States in 1954. Otto von Bolschwing uh, was working with the United States Army. 1955, he comes to the United States. And in 1955, William Clark is military intelligence uh, counterintelligence in Europe, marrying a Czechoslovakian woman. And um, in that interim, when the war is over, Von Bolschwing is working with our government. Galen is working with our government. Galen is, set, Galen is setting up his organization. And in 1955, William Clark is in Europe. Is as he marrying this woman from Czechoslovakia. He's in counterintelligence. Otto is coming to the United States to New York. And Galen is now having his own German offices. And in Germany... A woman named Helene Winter, she's born in Austria, the birthplace of the Nazi party, of Peter Drucker, of Otto Skorzeny, a who's who of European fascism and Nazism, a hotbed of the heart of Nazism. Helene Winter marries a GI, and his name is not in these articles, but in one story, she's Helene McDonald. So I imagine the man she married is McDonald, unless that was, I don't think it was an alias, but she probably worked under Ronald Reagan as McDonald until she uh, became Von Damm and married a German banker. She marries a GI, and she marries a fellow from the same army company as Byron Leeds, the man that she married last year, who's going back to Vienna with her. So in Germany is Helene and a GI, and that was a very common way to come to this country to bring somebody with you, a wife, and she automatically becomes a citizen. Before he marries her, she marries him, she leaves Vienna and goes to Sweden. And in my letter to the congressional committees, I asked the question, who did she see in Sweden? Was she already part of the Galen group when she he opens his own offices in 1956 and she goes to Sweden and Germany and marries a GI. Now, Axel Wenner Grin was the notorious richest man in the world, gave billions to Hitler out of Sweden. That's the Electrolux uh, person. Grin worked with Dr. Urban and with Errol Flynn. Axel Wenner Grin worked with them when Errol Flynn was making the movies with Ronald Reagan. So there was a web here of out of the Swedish group, and it also involved the Duke and Duchess of Windsor down in the Bahamas, and a network of spies, international spies. But out of Sweden, there was a Carl Heinz Kramer, who I don't know yet if this is the brother of Fritz Kramer, a uh, German-English spy who worked with Himmler and Himmler's masseuse and with Alan Dulles and Mr. Carl Wolf and the CIA, later the CIA, but worked. He's a shipper, shipbuilder now in Sweden. 
but he worked with the Nazis and with Alan Dulles when he was in the OSS. And Carl Fritz Kramer is up in Sweden. Now, that doesn't mean the whole country is Nazi, but she went from Austria. Looking at where she ended up, you have to look at where she was. So she was in Austria. Then she's in Sweden. And did she get any indoctrination or training there? And then she went to Germany. Did, what was she doing in Germany? Did she know Reinhard Galen? She's marrying two. She's marrying American GI, and she's going to marry another one from the same com company, both stationed in Germany, were they military intelligence? And what, if anything, was a relationship to Otto von Bolschwing? Now, he worked with uh, Galen and the CIA over there, and he arrives in the United States in 1955 and is in New York, and then he's in New Jersey, and he begins right away working for Warner Lambert uh, and Elmer Bobst, the political chemistry. <laughs> Warner Lambert's the company. Elmer Bobst is the man behind the career of Richard Nixon's ascendancy to the presidency. And, uh, of course, without Richard Nixon and that team, we wouldn't have Ronald Reagan following behind them. And she comes, uh, marries the GI and comes to the United States. What happened in Germany? Were the husbands in military intelligence, Byron Leeds, and what were they doing in Germany in 1959? In the Army, because, you see, Byron Leeds wasn't in business. He was in the Army when she met her husband who brought her here. Now, she goes to Detroit, Michigan in 1959 as a secretary. Detroit is also the home, I mentioned, of Ford Motor Company and General Motors, the largest corporate links, links to the Nazi Germany before the war, during the war, after the war. And Bishop Valerian Trifia, V-A-L-E-R-I-N-T-R-I-F-A, the most notorious Nazi criminal in the United States outside of Mr. Arturkovich down in Seal Beach, he was brought to the United States by von Bolschwing in, into Detroit, and von, uh, Helene von Damme is going to be working with TCI, von Bolschwing's corporation. They're both going to be living in Sacramento. So did she know trivia? Did she know the von Bolschwing network? Because she goes to Detroit, and she gets immediately into far right-wing American politics, the, the radical right-wing of it, and then from Detroit goes to Chicago, Illinois. By 1965, she has divorced the man who brought her to this country. That marriage was 59 to 65. And now she's in Detroit, in Chicago. And she, at the American Medical Association meeting, is where Ronald Reagan, who's going to run for governor of California, is speaking. Now, there were some well-known links to the AMA. One is Elmer Bops, who's very active, who was the cover for Otto von Bolschwing the medical unit that was the cover for his espionage activities. And there's Dr. Loyal Davis, Nancy Reagan's father, a very far-right conservative in Chicago. And she has very close links to the Vatican, and every major appointment has been a Catholic, either a knighted sovereign military order of Malta or a Catholic, and one-third of the ones that are notorious are part of the Odessa or the assassination teams in, and the going back to the OSS or the current Watergate scandals. And they, her appointments have been disastrous, but preponderance of Catholics that were in the forefront of trouble. I haven't studied the ones that didn't make waves, but in the research of political assassinations or Nazi networks, she put into office, and I'll name some of those. So she's in the city where the Continental Illinois Bank is that combines with Michael Sindona and David Kennedy, Secretary of the Treasury, and Cardinal Cody. And Paul Marcink is, and there's a certain route of the Odessa that I mentioned in regards to the uh, Gulf and Western story, the Odessa network, coming from Germany or Vienna, and one of those countries in Germany or Vienna, Frankfurt, or um, there were specific cities, whether it's Berlin or Frankfurt uh, or Munich, and Vienna coming to the United States, going to Detroit and going to New Jersey. I told you before, tapping Houston or tapping Chicago and then getting about their little business, okay? Now, she here's Ronald Reagan, and she goes to California. She's working, helping campaign for Percy, an extension of the man whose closest contacts, the Rockefellers, uh, had brought in these Nazis, like von Bolschwing and Trifia. Those are the ones they brought in. And later, she is politically to be wrapped up with those people like J. Peter Grace and the notorious I.G. Farb and, uh, connection so that she has no disregard for those people and her appointments are linked directly to them. So she comes out to California and she marries a man uh, when she's working for Ronald Reagan, Christian Von Damme. 
Now, when she marries Christian Van Damme, she's working for Ronald Reagan, and she gets onto the Reagan uh, offices by William Clark, who had been over in Europe in counterintelligence. Just when Galen's to splinter his group and Von Wolschwing's to come to the United States, Helene is uh, brought to Ronald Reagan by William Clark. Now, it is exactly 8.30. We're going to take a one-minute break and go on to the saga of Helene Von Damme. We'll go back some more on Helene Von Damme, who is going to be nominated, or the hearing comes up, as ambassador to Vienna. The first half hour, in case you didn't hear it, I have the names of the members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee if you write to me, I'll send you their names. And uh, if you want to call the uh, offices there, you can, and, and Mr. Burke, and get the uh, information on the committee and have them mail it to you, or I can do it for you. 202, that's the Washington number, 224-3121, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Okay, Mr. Clark, we're going back to William Clark. He was in military army intelligence over in Europe, and comes back to this country and begins to work for Ronald Reagan, and Reagan makes him a justice of the Supreme Court. He, he never w got through law school, but that didn't matter to Ronald Reagan. And Clark claimed credit for putting Mr. Deaver and Meese and Helene Von Damme in the office there. So she begins to work 1966 to 1972. Um, Helene Von Damme is working for Ronald Reagan and as his secretary. And this is important because the years that he was running for governor, she just heard him once and starry-eyed, comes to California. Then she's placed in charge, and I think, and I refer to her as his watchdog, his control, uh, his babysitter, maybe somebody who just kept a handle on everything that went in and out of the office there. And she is, as I say, married to Christian Von Damme, in 1970, now he's described as a German international banker. Uh, that was the first description of him in the Los Angeles Times in 1971. Then there was a story of Christian Von Damme working at La Paz, Bolivia. That was a United Press story, September 9, 1982. Um, and then there were links, other stories of Ronald Reagan making deals uh, of justice or helping bail out the son of the cocaine king down in Bolivia, and of course the Claus Barbie story has come with the links of John J. McCloy to Claus Barbie that was on one of the major broadcasting stations last week, and I was doing several broadcasts on the notorious McCloy from the Warren Commission with Alan Dulles on the Warren Commission and his work with Nazis before, during, and after the war. So uh, Claus Barbie showed the role of the cocaine king, the cocaine operations, the politics, his role with the military, with the death squads, Che Guevara and many others, the notorious death squads in South America, and working with the government, and with, if they work with the government, they work with our intelligence and with the Bank of America. So what has to be cleared up, one of the things, is why is Helene using the name Von Damme to go back to Austria? She's Mrs. Byron Leeds now, but that doesn't sound German enough, okay? But Christian Von Damme, is from Germany, and that sounds Christian enough to get be ambassador to Vienna. Uh, I wonder if she's even thinking of changing her name to be Mrs. Leeds when she goes there. Right now, it hasn't changed at all. But there's a lot of area to be exposed about what is Christian von Dom doing? What are the Bank of America debts? Are they tangled to the cocaine money? You know, Hollywood and cocaine and the notorious Pat Boone Nugent hand connections and the Wells Fargo connections to Australia and Ronald Reagan and Vegas is not far isolated from each other. I'll have to draw you another octopus like I did the Vatican CIA of the Hollywood cocaine connections pretty soon. I'll make one of those for you. So that she marries Christian Von Damme in 1970. And in 1968-69 is when TCI, that corporation, was set up by Otto von Bolschwein, Trans International Computer Investment Corporation. It was formed from 1968-69. The Odessa Network, I mentioned the uh, Simon Rifkin, the attorney, and it involved Greg Bouts, the attorney for Kirk Kerkorian, who was Howard Hughes' attorney, who represents MGM now. This whole network, this TCI, was set up 
for a purpose of electronic, sophisticated space weapons, ocean weapons for spying. One of their agents was the notorious Frank Turple. That's how I hit on to Von Bolschring when I heard that Frank Turple worked for Stanford Technology. Then the whole world of spying out here and into Iran, Argentina, all over the world opened up. TCI was set up, and one of their offices was in Beverly Hills, and one in Sacramento, and Otto von Bolschwing, the notorious inheritor of the Galen operation. When Galen opens up his German office, uh, von Bolschwing comes to this country. The notorious von Bolschwing is the head of that and lives in Sacramento, as does Helene von Damm and her new husband, the German banker, Christian von Damm. So when Otto moves to Sacramento and TCI is off and running, and she is Mrs. Mrs. Christian von Damm from 1970. Uh, she divorces him in 1978. She's been in Sacramento with the governor from 1966 to 1972, but by 1970, given that little time span from 66 to 70, William Clark is uh, brought in and working in a justice for the Supreme Court and brought Helene in. The TCI is formed. Christian has married Helene. And in 1972, uh, uh, she is representing Ronald Reagan in the transition team. She's the executive assistant during Reagan's business years. You know, he's soon to become president. Okay, but she stays with Von Dom legally. She hasn't changed her name until 1978. Now, Ronald Reagan has this personal secretary, for, from 1966 to 72, testing the Isla Vista, the People's Park, the Soledad Brothers, the San Quentin Six, the shootout, Marin County shootout. Those were the years the Manson family, the, the whole era of violence going on out here in California. Good testing ground for Scorzeni's terrorism. That's what it was. And, and of course, the Manson family goes back to the Spahn Ranch and Howard Hughes and the Crip Organization right next door, the German Crips, um, the network of California terrorism that I've described so much as part of our Odessa here in the United States. Now, in 1980, uh, Ronald Reagan needs a little breather, and he's going to be president. And so he, he, he has his Helene back east raising money for the Northeast Regional Finance. She's the Northeast Regional Finance Director. Now, this is a little girl from Vienna who goes to Sweden and Germany and then to Detroit and then to Chicago and then to Sacramento. And the boss now is going to be president. Remember, Rockefeller was deep sixth, February 1979. So by 1980, Reagan can go for the big bucks because there's nobody in his way. Now, I had a lot of controversy with my friends in New York and others that they recall and even taped the lectures I gave at the Elgin Theater and on uh, WBAI in New York that Ronald Reagan would be president of the United States. I was saying that in 1974-75, and uh, this is when Reagan was supposed to have his transition years, his business years, and she was with him as executive assistant. And there was nothing to stop that machine. That was decided. And once you know the characters and the way they move and play, they don't change rules, and Reagan was to be it, and Rockefeller was deep-sixed with all his money. Megan Marshak and Poinchetta Pierce and company could unload Nelson, and he went under, and on the scene then, there's nothing to stop Reagan. So she's raising $2.5 million. Now, one of the things in my letter to the Senate Foreign Relations, where did the $2.5 million? She's a staunch defender of Raymond Donovan, and there are... You know the mob connections and the casinos in New Jersey. And recently we've heard about the Genovese family having operations right on the military bases. And there's a lot of money there. Lissio Jelly from the Italian P2s planning a coup in a fascist dictatorship in Italy was at Ronald Reagan's inauguration and put up Mr. Big Bucks. And a lot of money came in from the Vatican and from the fascist groups. How would this young woman, she's out in California all this time, allegedly, uh, just with the governor there, goes to the Northeast. I bet if I put a circle around New York and New Jersey, uh, that's where the $2.5 million came from. I bet you didn't have to travel very far. And, of course, Byron Leeds, the man she married last year, is from New Jersey, the one that she knew a long time ago when her husband and Byron were in the Army together. So she picks up $2.5 million for Ronald Reagan, this sweet little thing, 
and then comes back, and in 1980, the election takes place, 1981, the inauguration, and she's in Washington on the transition team. Uh, she's deputy assistant to the president, and that was the time then to bring in the juicy Nazi and the Odessa and the defense appointments. 1981, director of presidential personnel deciding who's who and who gets the jobs and screening out a very important position. 1982, assistant to the president for the United States, appointments, cabinets, and jobs. And then the uh, main person making those appointments stepped down, and she became officially chairman of the nominating committee of the president of the United States. He has a sheet for a press conference where he's nominating her to be ambassador to Vienna, and she's chairman of the nominating committee, a member of the president's commission on executive exchange, and he nominates her to be ambassador to Vienna. So her background uh, with Christian von Damm, with Otto von Bolschwing, and so forth, is really open to examination. Now, getting to the von Bolschwing operation and the TCI story, in the time period that William Clark was in military intelligence over there, and she's coming to this country soon, there was a time period when Otto alone, working for Warner Lambert, and went, this is 1955 up till 1969, where he's making his travels. He was, according to documents that have been obtained, in Austria, Argentina, Uruguay, Mexico, Bermuda, the Bahamas, in Spain, in Portugal, in Gibraltar, in Holland, in Belgium, in Great Britain, Luxembourg, West Germany, West Berlin, Italy, and Switzerland. Now, that's a lot of traveling. I mean, that's what's on the books, and goodness knows what else. And then he begins, he opens up and becomes the president of that notorious uh, organization called the TCI. Now, I have the corporation papers that Pete Carey got for me. He's the reporter who broke the story on the von Bolschwing uh, exposures in the San Jose Mercury. Pete got the corporation papers of how TCI was formed. And from what I can see from the dummy fronts out of Las Vegas to the Bahamas with money being poured in from Europe to uh, telephone numbers in the Bahamas, and they involved Miami and Dallas, Texas, I would venture to say that when I chart that for you, this will be part of our story from Dachau to Dallas. It will go to the, even going back to the original Permandex, the killing of John Kennedy. I've charted the names and the people and the incidences, but right now I want to just take you to the parts about Helene von Damm when TCI was formed. Uh, it was described in a newspaper at the time. It was investigated as being a big scandal, the largest corporate scandal, the biggest in the state history. And Pete Carey got a hold of the papers, the court papers, securities fraud. This is the newspaper in uh, Sacramento, biggest in the state history to be resolved. And uh, people involved with forming TCI were splintered off, and then it was handed over to Philco Ford, ITT, uh, and Stanford Research and the real biggies, and and I'll give you the names of some of those. But Helene, according to the testimony of Mr. O'Sullivan, he said the ex-governor Reagan's private secretary, Helene von Damm McDonald, they put von Damm because by then she had married him, but he's testifying and used the name McDonald. That's where I picked it up from the court records, participated in both the purchase and in the sale of securities from TCI. Now, Ozzie Williams, who was part of TCI, they began letting him be the, the runner or the schlepper, getting this thing organized and off the ground, had written a letter to Jack Anderson. I have a copy of it, a rough draft. And he describes the purchase and the sale of uh, securities by Helen Von Damm and uh, the role that she played in contributing to getting it off the ground. Now, when she's asked about this, she denies that she had any part. Larry Vance, in his testimony on the organization, said uh, he was talking about a group of syndicators and himself who wanted to get it going, and they saw an article in Time magazine called The money, Hidden Money Trail, How the Mafia Hides the Money Through Switzerland, and so forth. They said, and then Otto von Bolschwing was hired through a contact of Dutch Van Roy. Van Roy worked with the Krups over in Europe and has a notorious biography that I'll get into later, but Otto von Bolschwing had been remember, in the Nazi party, in the SS, the OSS, was now in the United States to take over the Galen operation. It said Otto von Bolschwing was hired through a contact of Dutch Van Roy, this is over in Europe, who was a private investigator, and he came and brought expertise to the corporation in the form of a consultant. 
This is Otto von Bolschwing. And this is important because when I talk about Gulf and Western or Peter Drucker or how these organizations get big, they start with, Otto can tap into the Borman money, to the Odessa money from the banks that was released to start these big corporations. Otto uh, brought expertise to the corporation as a consultant. He had, and it refers to what he did, Otto and I finally got together, this is Larry Vance and Otto, were the only ones that ever did any work on the trips as far as locating corporations for acquisition. Remember how Gulf and Western gobbled up 80 we located Futh, F-U-T-H, in Germany, another firm in Switzerland, I don't remember off the bat, one in South America we got. We started getting active in the acquisition, and they were legitimate arrangements. We went to Intalcom, I-N-T-A-L-C-O-M, which Mr. Senenkis had a big chunk of. He refers to Mr. Senenkis. Who was Mr. Senenkis that they were working with? Uh, Manuel Senenkis, F. T-H-E-N-A-K-I-S, a cousin of Aristotle Onassis. He's described in the brochure of TCI in this way. Mr. Senekis has been a member of the company's board of directors since May 69. This is what Hawaiian taps into, into Sacramento. He's a member of the executive committee since August 69. He was president and chief executive January the 1st, 1970. That's when she starts in with Christian Von Damme, and they're very international. Mr. Sinankis was president and chief executive officer of the company. He is president of the Aerospace Optical Division of International Telephone and Telegraph Company, that's ITT, and for over five years. He was employed by Philco Ford Corporation, initially as director of space vehicle operations and then vice president and general manager of space and reentry systems division. Mr. Sinankis has a diploma of engineering from the technical University of Athens, a Master's of Science in Electronic at Columbia University, a Ph.D. in Electronics at Columbia, Postgraduate School of Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania, Diploma in Advanced Communications at Bell Laboratory. Mr. Von Bolschwing, it goes in, joined the company in 1969. Now, these are no slouches. One of the men who joined the company, Mr. Nangle, worked for Ford Motor Company, Philco Ford, graduated at Boston College, magna cum laude, and the who's who of who's on the board is the entire network of our very nice Defense Department. In fact, Mr. Dr. Otto Berg, B-E-R-G, is one of the people that the Queen of England and her husband went to visit with the uh, Packards and, and the Kennedys from Stanford. This was one of the persons that was part of entertaining the King and Queen of England. These are the corporate board of Otto von Bolschwing, no slouchers, but, but they started little with their little trips buying up companies around the world. This fellow is testifying, Larry Vance, we never did know what the corporation was really supposed to do other than being a holding company and to acquire companies that were computer-related industry. And then they asked him, have you ever heard of industrial manufacturing corporation? And he said, no. And the person asking the question in the court hearing says, that was a corporation set up by Mr. Williams and Mr. Kowalsk, K-A-O-W-A-L-C-Z-Y-K, in Las Vegas through a stockbroker in Vegas. Now, Mr. Williams set the groundwork for the TCI and for Otto Bull and Bolschwing to step in. And Elaine Von Damme was a translator of German to English while she was the secretary to the governor in California. He says they set up a company called Lamb Plane, L-A-M-P-L-A-N-E. I asked Otto von Bolschring what these guys were doing, and he said, well, they are doing such and such, and that's all I know about it. We call them the cowboys. I don't really care to go across it too much. We group them together and call them cowboys. All of the syndicators except Oftebro, O-F-T-E-B-R-O. Now, I mentioned some of the cowboys. There was Mr. Weekel, W-E-I-K-E-L. Mr. Kowals, I mentioned before, K-O-W-A-L-C-Z-Y-K. Mr. Schlothauer, S-C-H-L-O-T-T-H-A-U-E-R, Mr. Williams, and Mr. Bott. They operated out of the bars. They never went to work on time. Uh, Otto set up a shell, and Mr. Williams put it together. And they asked him if he knew Helene Von Damme, and then he referred to Helene Von de Griff. Now, Helene 
Duty, D-U-T-Y, Von de Griff. Now, if this, this may be an alias that she used under the uh, TCI, like Candy Jones used these aliases because they referred to this name in, in terms of Helene Von Damme. And part of the testimony said most of the people that we brought in from out of the town, like Otto von Balschwing or people like that, were taken to Aldo's, which is a restaurant, and they were taken, instead of being taken, they should have been taken to the office for business reasons, and I don't know why, but they met in bars, and they met in restaurants, and they met like in telephone booths and in the Bahamas, and everything was very hush-hush, and it, there were dummy fronts, just as, say, John DeLorean goes down to Huntington Beach and sets up a dummy front with a uh, phone connection or mailbox somebody else's place. He said, it was my responsibility on two of the trips to take care of all the finances. I had to go to the bank, draw the money, pick up the tab when we went for hotels and mil, uh, meals and so forth. So Mr. Larry Vance is giving a view of Von Bolschwing going to Europe with him to gobble up companies that becomes the network for TCI that has respectable lawyers in Washington, D.C. And again, Mr. Rifkin, Simon Rifkin, who set this up, who's one of the lawyers that set this operation up, was lawyer for the Sterling Bank, for the bank that Michael Sendona and the Vatican used for Chris Craft, and that's a corporation that John DeLorean was on the board of. So that what I'm doing is putting together a lot of the pieces of what is the Odessa and making sense out of them. And because she came from Europe and went to these specific cities and links up, links up with Von Bolschwing, who did place Triffy in Detroit, who did place people all over the world, who did work for Elmer Bops and the American Medical Association, uh, and for the Charles Percy connections to Rockefeller and Frank Wiesner and Nixon, Nixon working with Elmer Bops and Von Bolschwing. Uh, there's a heavy... A piece of evidence connecting these people that is not out of thin air, and Helene von Dahm going back to Vienna without any qualifications for the job must be a continuation of this network. In the testimony, they asked the question, when did Otto von Bolschwin get involved with TCI? They said somewhere in March or April prior to the formation of TCI. I want to take a firm international person because of the tremendous European market that existed in order to do this, it was necessary to have somebody, this is what Mr. Williams testified in court, somebody familiar with Europe, haha, <laughs> who could speak the language and who could get contacts over there to determine things like the computer market. He came to me again through Dutch Van Roy and subsequently went to Europe prior to my going there to set up the appointments. And he, he's explaining, Mr. Williams, how they brought in Von Bolschwing because he acquired property in Germany and went on and handled the correspondence for TCI. He was familiar with Europe. He knew the language. He knew the people. You better believe he did. And Dutch Von Roy, as I say, was linked to the Krups. In 1930 to 1940, Von Bolschwing was too. He was taking the money out of Europe, the Jewish capital for Krupp, and transferring it out of Europe and into Swiss banks, Nazi money that they would use later and how nice it would be to put it into this corporate level later. Now, what kind of appointments does Von Damme make that gets her a position uh, to go on to Vienna as the ambassador? Jack Anderson had a, a sentence about her, which I repeated on the air a while back, broadcast 529, that Helene Von Damme is double-checking all appointments to see that the proper conservative standards are going. She doesn't want to give in to the moderates, and she's there to screen the appointments. There's another story, on several articles on the importance of her position and her appointments. Well, what were some of her better positions? What did she do? There's Richard Allen, who was appointed to assistant for, he was the president's uh, head of national security affairs. He had to leave that office because of suggested money, whether it was 10000 or 100000 with Japanese uh, people that he had known a long time that suggested payoffs, and I believe were linked to the Lenin murder. Fred Fielding, counsel to the president, he's still there high up to his neck in Watergate scandals with Robert Vesco, with William Casey, and the, all the dirty work behind the White House, he's still the counsel to the president. E. Pendleton James, assistant to the president. These are appointments she helped make for the president that, uh, and the transition team. He's still there, and if you want to read up his record, get your index of any uh, Watergate books and look up Pendleton James. Franklin Knopfsicker was appointed to the uh, assistant to the president for political affairs, 
he stepped down, he had conflicts with these people, and he may come back, but he was appointed. And while he was in Washington, or he still is, he became a co-slumlord with Helene Von Damme, and they bought property there that they were renting that was run down to poor black people in Washington, D.C. But Knopfseger, at the time of Watergate, was working at John Mitchell and the American Nazi Party, and the far, you can't get farther right than the Nazi Party, I don't suppose, with their network uh, across the United States. That was one of his contacts, and that's one of her co-property partners. William P. Clark, her mentor who brought her to the Reagan office, uh, now she rewards, she helps with the transition team. And it's only fair play that then they make her the ambassador to Vienna, you know, get back to where you came from and sit on the old scores, then he ashes, okay? William Clark became Secretary of State. He was Deputy, uh, Deputy Secretary of State under Haig, and then later he became the head of the entire National Security Agency when Richard Allen moved out. Uh, William Casey, director of the CIA uh, in the OSS, with William Donovan bringing Lucky Luciano and organized crime into Italy, bringing the mafia into the CIA. Notorious history with the Odessa from his very career in the Army in Europe and then in the United States. Scandals with the Security Exchange Commission with Vesco all hushed up. Casey, I couldn't believe that Ronald Reagan would get away with the appointment of him as director of the CIA. John Lehman, Secretary of the Navy, the scandals of the Abington Corporation with Northrop and Boeing, the conflicts of interest, strong links to the Vatican, first cousin of Grace Kelly. Every one of these here is a devout Catholic. Von, Ge Von Bolschwing was a Catholic brought here by the Jesuits. Uh, I'm not anti-Catholic, but I want to know where the separation of church and state, where you have national security agency, you have a central intelligence agency, and all these various agencies involved that she's made the appointments, and Helene, of course, is Catholic, too. She brings in John Lehman with his links to Henry Kissinger and National Security Council, the Vatican, and conflict of interest with the Abington, representing them and giving contracts for the F-18s. She appointed the James Watt, the Secretary of the Interior, who's raping the land and air, a puppet of the Coors people, the arch conservatives. <laughs> He's shaking his head here. What do you have what, mercy? Have no mercy on these. Do you know what they're doing to this country? Oh, huh? Not too well. Huh? Only you know what they're well. doing to this country? I mean, isn't it time? William French Smith involved in various scandals. There was a long article about some of these people and these appointments recently. It was in the Washington Post on uh, dirty laundry. No, Sanse Mercury. It was a reprint yeah, from the Washington Post. Dirty laundry in Reagan's kitchen cabinet, February the 6th, 1983, by Robert Kaiser. And it has a rundown of Richard Allen, William Casey, Raymond Donovan, Max Ugel, William French Smith, James Watt, Robert Mino, Nancy Harvey, Stort, S-T-E-O-R-T, William F. Harvey, Daniel Bogart, these are scandals. Thomas Reed, Tom, uh, John Lehman. This has a breakdown of dirty laundry in Reagan's cabinet. Now, she made the appointment. So what does she get? A promotion to Vienna? If you can read all this in the United States and you can't read German, can you imagine what she would do in Vienna, which is the hotbed of bringing spies into this country for more anti-Soviet propaganda? There have been long articles about these appointments. Another long story that was published in the New York Times in November this last year, Political Ambassadorships, the Twain Shall Meet. And this is a, an article about, by Malcolm Toon. Some appointees have made us look like the laughing stock of the world. And there's a picture of Von Damme in the article, Helene Von Damme. And this is a quotation of Malcolm Toon with a laughing stock of the world. Uh, D. Lowell Jensen, the former uh, goon squad out here in California, the law enforcement and our terrorism was made the assistant attorney general. He's being promoted now in Washington, D.C. to the attorney. And Raymond Donovan and Alex Haig, who had to step out, and J. Peter Grace. We have about one minute, and I could go on and on her lousy, rotten appointments. I think you get the idea that I don't want Helene Von Dom to go on to Vienna and continue what she's doing here, because then she brings in the Galen agents behind the Iron Curtain who come out and all we need is more propaganda against the Russians. Let's get on with World War III. She'll bring in these terrible people who've been so oppressed, and we'll give each taxpayer, we'll give them a half a million, and they'll tell their sad story. They're richer than you and me, and they're brought over escaping communism. Like, who now? Did you read that Re President Reagan today said he would adopt her as his daughter, and the Chinese were furious? And what did it cost to get who now in this country? You know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, the time is up. I've got to go. The hour is over. This is May Russell. You keep on reading that news, and I'll be back with you next week. This is KAZUFM in Pacific Grove, California.